I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Psalms, chapter number 19. Uh, I want to have us look at one of the uh, favorite Psalms that I have. People used to ask me when I was a pastor, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And I would usually tell them whatever book I was in. Uh, what's your favorite verse? It's whatever verses I happen to be speaking on. But if I was put into a corner, I would probably tell you the 19th Psalm is, is right up there for me uh, with, uh, with many other Psalms. But this one right up there with me is perhaps my favorite because of so much information that is here uh, in this particular Psalm, Psalm chapter number 19. Uh, I have a little booklet that somebody gave me some years ago. I've been using it in my own private time at home. It has a listing of the Psalms, three Psalms and a proverb every day. And you do that uh, for about uh, two months, and you get through the whole thing. And when I came to Psalm 19, I kept going back to it because of the blessing that this psalm is, Psalm chapter number 19. Let's pray for just a moment, and then we want to look at Psalm 19 today. Father, thank you so much for this church, for its history, for its ministry. Thank you for the honor of standing in this pulpit that has been such a great place of teaching the Word of God for so many years. Uh, thank you, Lord, back in, I think it was 1973, you led Pastor Johnson to begin this ministry. And Lord, thank you for the way this work has gone on for so many years, uh, faithful to the Word of God. There's not a greater testimony than that. And thank you for Dr. Harmon and all that he does in his leadership here as well. Now, bless us today, Father. Thank you for your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. When I became the president of the college that I was at, I had ministry in South Florida, and for about a year, I kept the ministry in South Florida, and I would go back and forth, fly back and forth uh, from Miami, Florida, up to Binghamton, New York. And so I had a lot of uh, frequent flyer miles, obviously, and often would sit in the front of the airplane. And one day, I was on the airplane in the front, and there was a young man, 18 years of age, that sat next to me. And he was a, a very, very uh, vivacious uh, young man, with tremendous uh, abilities, I could tell. Uh, he was a student, a freshman student at Temple University, and uh, we chatted for a few minutes, and he found out what I did. He said, well, I've always wanted to, to talk to somebody like you. Now, I wasn't sure what he meant by that, but I thought maybe, well, we'll find out where this conversation is going. He said, I, I, I've always wanted to talk to somebody, and he said, how do you really know there is a God? How do you really know that? And so I opened my Bible that I had with me there, put it on my briefcase, to Psalm 19. And we walked to the 19th Psalm. We had a wonderful time together. And uh, he listened. He asked questions. It was obvious this was not just a cursory conversation, but a conversation he was very interested in. And when I got done, I went over the gospel with him. I gave him the gospel presentation, and I just felt in my heart he was going to come to Christ right there on the airplane. And when I got done uh, going through the gospel, I said to him, now, would you like to be saved? Would you like to come to Christ as your Savior. It was interesting. I wish you could have seen him. He looked out the window. He was on the window side. He just stared out there. It seemed like an eternity. It was probably less than a minute. He just stared. Then he turned back to me and said, no, he said, I don't think I can do that. And I said, well, why not? I said, did I not present it well enough? And I said, what, what's the problem? And he said to me, he said, well, my father uh, just sent me down to Fort Lauderdale. I was down there for spring break. He paid for everything. He said, I have a great father but he doesn't believe there's a God. And he said, uh, I would have to ask my father if I could do this. And I said, well, can you give me your father's phone number? I'll call your father. And he said, no, no, you're not going to do that. He said, I have to do this with my, him and me alone. And I thought about that afterwards. There was a young man who maybe was ready to come to Christ, but for some reason he could not, and it was the influence of his father. And I've thought about that many times. Maybe the better question is not, is there a God? But how can God be known? How do we know about God? This psalm, Psalm 19, tells us the answer to that. Follow with me the psalm. Let me read it to you. And then I want you to see with me what this psalm tells us about knowing God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through the, all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. 
His going forth is from the end of the heavens and in a circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are pure, are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Isn't that a powerful psalm when you read it? What a powerful psalm. This psalm has a lot of titles. You can give a lot of titles to this psalm. You could call this psalm the, the psalm of the, of the greatness of God. And this could be spoken of as that young people like to word, use the word awesome. This is an awesome psalm because this is about the greatness of our God. But I want you to look at this psalm with me this morning from the standpoint of thinking about how God can be known. And there are three thoughts that are found in this psalm. There are many thoughts, but three thoughts I share with you this morning. In verses 1 through 6 of the psalm, you will find that God is known through the wonders above. He's known through the wonders above. In verse 7, going down to verse number 11, God is known through his word, through the word of the living God. And then finally, in verse 12 through 14, God is known through his workers, his people. Now let me say this to you today. Before we look at the verses, the psalmist is saying to us that you can look to the heavens and learn something about the greatness of God. You can look into the word of God and see who God really is. But not many people look to the heavens and come to God. Some do. Not many people just pick up a Bible on their own understand what to read and come to the Lord. Some do. But that last part, he says, God is known through his people is where the rubber really meets the road. So let's look at these three thoughts. Verses one through six, he said, God is known through the wonders above. In verses one through six, we find what we call arguments for God. In verse one, you find some of those arguments. It says in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. When you uh, come to a college, Bible college like I was at, one of the first years you learn about the arguments for God. For example, there is what is called the teleo argument for God, which says that there is an order to the universe. You look to the universe, and there's an order to the universe. Uh, there is the cosmological argument for God, which says to us there is a cause. Something brought this into existence. There is also what is called the anthropological argument for God, which tells us that there is a morality to the people that are on the earth. I have a dog at my house, a beautiful little dog. He's a little Shih Tzu dog. He's a great family pet. And uh, when we first got him, he would go down to the neighbors where there was a, a big shepherd dog there who could have eaten him with one bite probably. And he would go down there and try to eat the food of that dog. And I would tell him not to go down there. One day he went down there. I picked him up. I put him in my lap. And I was scolding the dog. Don't go down there. And I thought to myself, this is a dog. He doesn't understand a word I'm saying here. And I was trying to explain to him not to go down. So I found a leash did a lot more than explaining him not to go down there. There's something different about the inhabitants on the earth. They are body, soul, and spirit, which is what you are. And that is an argument uh, for God. And then there is also what is called the ontological argument for God, which means there must be a perfect being somewhere. R.C. Sproul put it so well when he said these words. Men are never duly touched and impressed with a conviction of their insignificance until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. God is mighty. God is great. God is powerful. God is sovereign. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. God is all of these things rolled into one. 
If someone does not believe there is a God, there's a lot of explaining they have to do as to how all this stuff got here. I was in a doctor's office a, a few years ago, and there was a science journal there, and I picked it up, and a writer by the name of Danielle Yankowski was writing about the universe, and Danielle Yankowski, who I do not know anything about them, wrote that there are 350 billion galaxies in the universe. I don't know if that's true or not. That's what Danielle Yankowski said. I've never counted them. That's a lot of galaxies. Not long ago, I read that there's somewhere between 260 billion and 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. I don't know if that's true or not either. But if it's anything close to that, how did all that happen? I did read another article written by a scientist named Ed Wilson who said in the Amazon, there are 3,000 different species of trees in a one-mile radius. He also wrote there are 10,000 species of ants. I know that's true. They're all around my house where I live, by the way. There are 300,000 flowers and plants and 10,000 species of birds. Again, I don't know that as a fact, but as scientists who's supposed to know that, that's what he's saying. If any of that is close to being true, uh, he is a mighty, mighty God, isn't he? It's the argument for God. In verse number one and verse number two, he tells us also about the argument, the argument about God. First of all, it's the argument for God. Then it's in verses 1 and 2, it's the argument about God. Verse 2, he says, Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And again, if you go back to verse number 1, he says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And I believe the theme of the scripture is the glory of God. It's about his glory, about his greatness, about his, his, his awesomeness, his uniqueness. So it says it declares the glory of God. And here the Bible tells us people can know about God because of the universe itself. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. In fact, turn over to Romans 1 20 for just a, a moment with me. Go over to Romans chapter 1 and look at verse number 20. The apostle Paul is very clearly uh, talking there about this same concept at the beginning of Romans. And in verse 20, he says, For the invisible things, that's the things that are not seen, of him from the creation of the world, the things that are seen, are clearly seen, being understood that the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Amazing, isn't it? God is saying to us when people can look to the universe, they can see the God who really is. One of the issues I think that we have today in our world today is there is a God that we want. God, I want, I want $50,000. Oh, God, give that to me. You're God, you can give it to me. God, I'd like to have a brand new Lexus in my driveway by Friday. Uh, could you give that to me? I heard about a lady who said she wanted three children. And she was fussing with her three children. Her friend said, well, you always wanted three children. She said, yeah, but not these three. I don't want these three anymore. <laughs> it's all different things that we may want. But that's not the God who is. Sometimes we say, well... God wouldn't do that. How do we know God would not do that? Sometimes we try to tell people how God thinks or how God works. The only way you know that's through the word. And the fact of the matter is the psalmist is making it clear to us here that there's something about this argument about God. I've never met missionary Helen Rosevere. I, I have read a couple of her booklets and heard a few stories. She was an amazing missionary in Africa. And she tells this one story. She said that she got in her truck one day and she was driving out through an area that was very dangerous. And a truck, they just stopped. So she got out of the truck and she opened up the hood looking at the motor and had no idea what to do. And she turned around and there were now standing there some warriors demanding that she go with them. And she assumed that maybe this might be the end of her life. So she went with them and when she came back to the village where they were at, she went to the chief and the chief was very welcoming to her. And he talked to her who are for a few minutes, and then she, he said to her, are, are you here from the set one? And she said, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, he said, I've been looking at the universe, the world. Are you here to tell us about him? And she said, well, yes, I am. That's what I'm here for. And she talked to them about the universe, talked to them about Jesus, and according to the testimony of Helen Roosevelt, she led the chief and many of them to Christ right there. She then had meal with them, and they went back to the truck that doesn't work. 
And these warriors are carrying their spear, and she's thinking, what in the world can they do with my truck? Put a spear in it? They went back, and she got in the truck. She turned on the ignition, and it started right up. And she drove away. Isn't that amazing? Praise God for things like that. But you know, there aren't many stories that all of us know about people coming to God like that. That's wonderful. But God doesn't often look down from heaven and say, was the chief looking for God? I'm going to have your truck stop right here. I, I've never had that happen to me. Also, if you look at this passage in verses 3 through 6, he talks about the arrangement by God. There's not only the argument of God, the argument about God, but the, is the, there is the arrangement by God in verses 3 through 6. He says, there is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. In other words, this declaration of this God is declared anywhere in the world. How is that possible? He said, there's no speech, but where it's declared. What about places the gospel is not at? Well, look what he says in verse 4. Their line has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. He says, how do you know about this God? Well, you get up in the morning, and somewhere in the world... There's a thing that's up in the sky. It's called the sun. And people look at the sun and they sense the heat and they say, how in the world did that come about? I live in Binghamton, New York, just outside of Binghamton, New York. Last year, we were voted as the city of America that had the least amount of sunlight. Everybody up there is on vitamin D, everybody. And so... I read that, and, and the reason is because of the Finger Lakes, the clouds come down, the sky there is, uh, is the, the cloud covering is very low in the sky, and, and that's what happens, and, and we joke about it up there because we all need some sunlight, but the fact is when that sun comes out, you say, boy, it sure is brilliant. Isn't this a beautiful day today, by the way? Seeing that sun is a beautiful thing. So verses 1 through 6, we are said, how, we're told, how do you know there is a God? Well, you know there is a God, but how is he known? He's known by the wonders above. Take a look at the sky. Take a look at the, uh, at the plants. Take a look at the vegetation. Take a look at the people in this room today. Body, soul, and spirit. God's known that way. That's the second way that God is known. It's found in verses 7 down to verse number 11. And it's very clear that God is known through his word. He's known through the wonders above, but he's also known through the word of God. Beginning in verse 7, as in so many of the Psalms, there are words that are used to describe the scriptures, the word of God. One of those words, for example, is the word law. Another is the word testimony or the word statutes or the word commandment. And you find these words in this section of scripture. He's talking about the fact that God is known through the word. Now, if you look at verse number 7, here's what he says. And by the way, there are six almost like equations that are here. God is saying, because this is true, this also can be true. Because of this, it will result in this, six of them. The first one is in verse number seven. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's the word of God. I heard a brother praying today. Thank God for his word today. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. This book, when it's heard and listened to and presented it converts the soul. There's something powerful about reading the Word of God. You can read the Word of God all your life and pick it up one day and say, I never saw that before. It changes you. It converts the soul. It does something in your life that's different. People that do not follow Christ do not understand how people can go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and have revivals and Bible schools. They say, that's too much of all of that. Well, when it gets in your spirit, you just want the more. You just want to keep going after it. It's there for you. So he is speaking here about the conversion of the soul. My father was saved uh, when he, I think he was about 50 years of age. I was kind of a latecomer. My sister, older sister, and I, younger sister and I were, were latecomers along the way. And uh, my, my mother was a believer. And my mother uh, took us to a church in the area where the gospel was preached on Sunday morning. And my mother went there because she loved the Word of God. I went there, and I kind of liked it. My sister went along with me. We had other siblings that were older. They were moved out of the house by then. And uh, my father went because he coached the church softball team. 
And you had to go twice a month to coach the church softball team. So he went twice a month. There was another guy in the area, another pastor in the area, that he did not like at all. He was on the radio five days a week. It was called the Precious Promise Broadcast. My father would listen to that man preach, and he would complain about it. Tell everybody what was wrong with him. I didn't like that pastor either because my dad didn't like him, and I liked my dad. And so he was complaining all the time about this pastor. And then my dad came to Christ, and one of the greatest influences was that pastor bringing him to Jesus. And so when that happened, my dad decided, we're done with this other church. We're going to go to this man's church. That church had stuff going on all the time. I'm seven years old when that happened. I went there. They had Bible school. They had conferences. They had revivals, Sunday morning, Sunday night. As a little child, I, I never told my, pa- my parents for a long time, but I thought, this is way too much church. I like the other church once a week, one hour, we're good, out, I'm good. I'm only seven, how much bad can I do, you know? <laughs> and so I remember my mother one summer, that summer, sent me to Delhi Vacation Bible School. And I went, I came home, and the conversation went something like this. Uh, she said, did you like Bible school? I said, no. I thought for sure the judgment of God was going to fall on me when I told her that. And she said, well, do you want to go back? I said, no. Okay, she said, you don't have to go back. I was thrilled. Mom's seeing the light now. This is wonderful. Then mom said, you know what? We'll have Bible school right here at home. I said, what do you mean by that? She said, we'll have it right here at home. I said, you know, mom, I think I'd rather go back to the church. She said, no, we're going to do it right here at home. And she took me out on the back porch of our home. I could take you to the place today. And she opened up the Bible to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10. And that verse says, Enter in the rock, hide you in the dust for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. And she said to me as a young seven-year-old child, do you understand what that verse means? I had no idea what that verse meant. I had very low interest in what that verse meant. But then she began to drive home the fact that the reason I don't like church, the reason I like what's going on, is because I'm a sinner. Again, I'm only seven. But she kept telling me what a sinner I was. And you know, I'm telling you that story that happened a lot of years ago because something happened that day. I was converted. My mother kept driving at home and driving at home and driving at home. And all of a sudden, I realized I needed Jesus. I went back to Delhi Vacation Bible School, a place I did not like, and said, you know, those people are pretty nice over there now. They've changed. Though that I realized it was me that had changed. What does that? It is the word of God, an obscure verse like Isaiah 2.10. Why she used that, I have no idea. But that verse spoke to my heart, and that's what this passage is saying. The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. Notice also he says, the law of the Lord uh, is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the sure uh, of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's the connection. It's marvelous how when we realize how simple we can really be, how powerful the Word of God really is. And when you go to the Word of God with pride, you don't get much. But when you go as a young baby looking for some food, it's amazing what you get. It's amazing what happens. And so it's a connection. Notice also in verse 8, it's a correction. He says, the statutes of the right are right at rejoicing the heart. He speaks to her about being... A, correcting us i like the idea of rejoicing the heart when we get corrected we become better he speaks about the commandment of the lord is pure the commandment there speaks about enlightening the eyes and then he speaks also about the commandment in a sense of cleansing so you have conversion connection correction commandment then you have cleansing in verse number nine the fear of the lord is clean enduring forever and that's a subject all in itself on the subject of the of the fear of the lord and what that means to us the fear of the lord is clean it endures forever and then it says the judgments of the lord are true and righteous altogether it speaks there about the chastising hand of god which sometimes he gives to us so it's conversion connection correction commandment cleansing and it's chastising so verse 10 he says more to be desired what's more to be desired what he just said than gold I don't know about you, I kind of like gold. But he says, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, much more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The idea of the honey and the honeycomb in the Bible speaks about the land of 
of milk and plenty. And, and the Bible talks to us often about the land of milk and honey. And the Bible talks to us about the fact that this is a place of satisfaction. That's what we find when we find him. It's the word of God. People will come to know Jesus because of the word of God. I pastored in Florida for 15 years. It was a wonderful ministry down there. And we had a singles group down there with a young man by the name of Scott uh, who was in our group. And uh, one day after our service, I sat down with Scott and I gave him the gospel. He was a fine young man, very moral young man. And I asked him if he would like to accept Christ. He said, no, I'm not ready yet. So I said to him, I said, well, what will make you ready? He said, I've got to read the Bible all the way through. I did not think he would do that. I thought it was just a way of perhaps you know, getting rid of me. And, but he did. He read the Bible all the way through. And he came and told me about it. And I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, are you ready to accept the Lord now? He said, no, I'm not ready. I said, what do you need to do now? He said, I've got to read the Bible through again, all the way through. And I did not think he would do it. I, I, I thought, well, one time maybe, but twice will never happen. He read the Bible all the way through a second time. I asked him, I said, are you ready to accept the Lord now? He said, no, I'm not ready. So I, I took him with me to Israel. I paid his way to go with me to Israel. I, I just knew there at Calvary or the empty tomb, I knew somewhere maybe in the Sea of Galilee or he'd come to my room at night, he was going to accept the Lord. We got to the end of the trip. He's made no decision. We baptized people in the Jordan. No, no Scott in any of that. I said, Scott, are you ready to accept the Lord? He said, no, I'm not ready yet. I felt like saying, Scott, give me my money back. You know that? I said, well, Scott, what's it going to take now? He said, I've got to read the Bible through again. And he did. And this time he gave me a notebook. I still have it in my library of verses he wrote down that meant a lot to him. And so he hadn't accepted Christ, and I had uh, some tickets that were given to me by a member of our church at that time. They were front row seats to the New York Mets, Florida Marlins baseball. Front row seats. And I remember we went to the ball game. He's a big Met fan, and I'm a Yankee fan, but, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to root for the, the Marlins that night because we're in Florida. <laughs> and I remember sitting there. The game is about to start. They were to start the game. And Scott leaned over to me, and he said, I'm ready to accept the Lord. I thought to myself, we're in the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> we're at the empty tomb. And now he wants to accept the Lord here, now? That young man is now my son-in-law. He married my daughter. And he's a fine young man. I'm thankful for him. But I look back at that, I thought he'll never come to the Lord. Now, he did that really on his own. He picked up the Bible, and he read it on his own. I know very few people who have ever read the Bible through once, much less three times, and come to Christ. The key to understanding this passage with this theme is in verses, uh, verses 11 through 14. God is not only known through the wonders above, he's not only known through the word of God, but he's known through his workers. And in verse number 12, it says, who can understand his errors? Now, remember, in the Old Testament, you read much about the psalm, and the message of the Old Testament so often is obedience brings blessing. When we get close to Jesus, when we follow Jesus, that's where the blessing's at. Here, he tells us in the Old Testament sense, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. The word faults there is the word that means blind spots. Blind spots in life. He says, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. That means to venture without authority. That happens sometimes with all of us, doesn't it? All of a sudden, we're in a situation where we say, how did I get myself into this? He said those presumptuous sins. He said, let them not have dominion over me. And the word dominion in there means the territory or sphere of influence. The territory or sphere of influence. He's saying, whatever you do, don't, don't let them have that territory. Take that territory back for Christ. He speaks also there, he says, uh, over them, he said, then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent of great transgression that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. He speaks there about this idea of transgression going over the limit, going too far, and meditating, he's speaking there about this idea of a devotional exercise whereby we are meditating on the word of God and it changes our life. Now let me go back to the story I told you at the beginning. 
young man on an airplane listening to the gospel. I think he was really interested. I think he would like to have maybe accepted the Lord. But he said, no, I've got to talk to my dad. Why does he have to talk to his dad? Because his dad has such a great influence in his life. He gets off the airplane, as far as I know, he may still be lost. I have no idea. I have no contact with him. But the man that was the influencer in him did not believe it was a God. And I want to say to you, church, today, you have no idea of the influence you can have on people's lives. You have no idea. There are people that will come up to you every once in a while and say, hey, thanks. And you say, well, you're welcome. For what? And then you, they tell you. And you say, I don't remember that. I can't tell you the number of people who come to me up in my life every once in a while and say, hey, thank you for something. And I, sometimes I don't even remember them. When I went to the college, there was a young lady in the college who was a student, and she said, uh, I, I'm, oh, I'm really looking forward to meeting you. You led my dad to Christ at, at youth group. So I met her. We had a nice time together. I said, let me meet your dad. I met him. I don't remember him. I don't remember what he's talking about. All I remember is that uh, I remember he told about uh, riding a bus. I remember the bus ride. But I don't remember leading anybody to Christ on that. You have no idea of the influence. My dear mother was a wonderful prayer warrior. My dear mother would often get up in the morning, and she was a seamstress, and she would run her sewing machine at 5 o'clock in the morning. I often thought I'd like to burn that thing. It got, wake me up every morning. But I, I remember well, I knew this. My mother would pray. It would stop running for a while, that machine. And she was praying. And one of the things that blessed me was the fact that she was praying for her family. I was part of that family. My dear wife, who, uh, you pray for her. She's battling cancer right now. She's had a second bout of cancer. and going, That's why she's not with us today. Very difficult time of cancer. But my wife, every morning, cancer or no cancer, she gets up, she gets her Bible out, she sits down at the table, I leave her alone, and she's talking to God. And her children know that. I know that. You have no idea the influence you make in people's lives. When I was a young man at college, I worked for a few months at a church uh, as a youth pastor just for a few months. And my wife was, and I were dating. And uh, the, there was a very small group of young people there. It, we loved them and they loved us, but just a small group. A couple of them, though, were, were like uh, difficult to get along with. And one of them was a young girl there. I'll never forget her. She had bright red hair. And, uh, and, and she, just, she really never listened to anything I'd, I'd say. And I remember one day I, I was talking. I was writing something on the chalkboard. That's what you used to do in those days. And I turned around, and she was climbing out the window. I said, where are you going? She said, I, I, I'm going outside. I said, well, you can't go out there. You've got to be in here. But she jumped out the window. She could have broken her leg. I went out and got her. I said, why don't you want to be in there? She said, I don't like you. You're boring. That's what she said. I said, well, no, isn't that encouraging? So I brought her back in, and I thought, you know, that's probably uh, the end of that. In, in, in a few months, I left there. I really forgot all about her. Years later, I was in Masson, Ohio, preaching at a Bible college at a Bible in, uh, conference. My wife was with me in just a, a, a very strict school there, a good school, very strict. President, you know, really well-dressed. He's here, and my wife is here. We're walking to lunch after the morning service. <laughs> and I heard someone yell out and say, oh, there you are. And I turned around, and here was a woman, beautiful woman with bright red hair, and she's running at me with her arms stretched out just like this. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not a good situation I'm in right now. <laughs> I got this president here. I got my wife here. I have no idea who she is, and she's running right at me. So I stood over here, and I put my wife in front of me like this. and <laughs> So she hugged my wife, and then she hugged me, and she looked at me. She said, you don't remember me? I said, no. And she said, well, and she gave me her name. And she was the girl in that youth group. And she said to my wife, and I, I want to thank you both for the influence you had in my life. And I thought, influence? This is the girl that said I was boring. <laughs> what kind of influence is that? 
And then she told me a couple other things about her life, and I finally said to her, I said, what are you doing here? She said, I, I teach her at this school. Wow. I must tell you, I thought, first of all, this place must have a hard time finding teachers from what I remember of her for teaching in this school. Influence. How do people come to know Jesus? You know, when Pastor Earl Johnson came here, I think it was in 1973, is that right? 1973. And many of you came to Christ under him. Many, many of you here brought to Christ under Pastor Harmon. All these years of the gospel going out from here, little do we realize the influence those two men have had in so many people's lives. But let me bring that to where all of us are at today. Little do we realize the influence we have by taking the gospel out that you take the gospel out. And part of it's not just living it, part of it's saying it, but part of it's just never giving up. Never giving up. How do people get to know about God? You know, in America today, we're not sure who God is. We don't know who God is in so many quarters. I believe that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. I believe that God the Father sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. That's who I believe God is. I believe it's the God of the Bible. And I, 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 I don't question that. It's not debatable to me. That's what I believe. But many people don't believe that. Many people don't understand how anybody could hold on to that. But that's exactly who the God of the Bible is. And so my encouragement to all of us here today is this. As a church, you have a wonderful testimony here. Never forget the influence you have because I believe the greatest way people get to know about God is through you. It's through you. Not do many people look up to the sky and say, ha, God. Some do. Not many people just pick up the Bible like my son-in-law did and read the Bible and say, there it is. He did. But many are influenced by the power of the gospel through somebody who does what they can do. And sometimes it takes a long time. And sometimes it's done very quickly. Verses 12 through 14 are talking about a devotional life that we need. But I want to say this because it's so important to say. The Christian life is not hard to live. It's impossible to live unless Christ is living his life through you. And whereas the psalmist is talking about this meditation, this devotional life, our devotional life must be driven to Christ and Christ driving his life through us. That's when we really can have influence. Let me pray, and I'm going to say a word about the books, and then I'll give it back. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the powerful influence we can have in life. And may that influence change us today. May this song challenge our hearts. May it encourage our souls. May it minister to our spirits, I pray. And we thank you, Father, for what it will do for us in Jesus' name. Amen.